Is this, is this on? Yes, my lord. Good, good. <clears throat> Hello, this is God speaking. Can we dial that down? Yes, my lord. Thanks. Welcome, new arrival to the Eternity Ward. Please take a number and make your way down to the left or the right to the waiting room. All you need is there the refreshments I made just for you. <laughs> I would tell you to steer clear of the apples, they're forbidden, um, and the two snakes. <clears throat> I mean, fools, sorry, that are chewing the fat in the corner, but you probably wouldn't listen anyway. So good luck, I bless you, and on your way. Welcome to the Eternity Ward, where we flick through alt-right magazines and chat with our buddies as we wait for an appointment with God. I'm Chris Adams. And I'm confused. What the hell are you doing doing the introduction? It's a free country. It's a free podcast. I can do the introduction if I want. You can't stop me. I just did it. Damn it. I'm Nick McKinnon. Hey, go, Nick. Yeah, I'm doing well. I've spent the day with my daughter on the couch because she's just had her tonsils out, so she's miserable. Hmm. Poor her. Poor her. I've still got my tonsils. So have I. I didn't think they really took them out anymore. Not only do they take them out, they take out adenoids as well, and I'd never even heard of adenoids. So there you go. There you go. How are you? I'm good. What are we talking about? What's our topic tonight? Yeah, topic tonight is bad language. Yeah. It's... Saying things that are offensive to people. All right. Does that sound good to you? So we're just going to spend all of this time just finding the most offensive things that we can say. Yeah. All right. Um, you're a mouth breather. Mouth breather? Yeah. How else do other people breathe? Uh, it's an insult. Is it? Yes. I've never heard of it. You need to pick an insult that I've heard of. No, I'm original, man. I go with the original ones. Well... <laughs> It's been around for a long time, that one, actually. <laughs> it's been around so long that I've never heard of it. So you got any insults for me, then? Sure do, you bleeding heart simpleton. Simpleton? Yeah, simpleton. Well, you're an oxygen thief. You're a faggot-loving, tree-hugging hippie. <laughs> um, uh, uh, redneck? You're a redneck. God, you yeah. got to get some better ones, Chris. You're aggressive, lefty, limp-wristed keyboard warrior. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to pull out the normal slurs. Um, no, they're fun. I'm not going to say any of those sorts of things, Dick McKinnon. I mean, Dick <laughs> McKinnon. I'm not. I'm just not going there. Nickel asshole. A student called me. That's right. That was a classic, yeah, wasn't that's it? That's one of my favourites. You poor little privileged white man feeling guilty. So why are we just screaming these offensive words at each other then? Oh, I've just been to a Milo Yiannopoulos talk and have just been picking up how to speak to people on the left, Chris. Okay. Milo. How to make friends and influence people, isn't that what it is? Well, how to influence people, perhaps. <laughs> how to get yourself banned from a country, Chris. Well, he didn't get himself banned. He's been. He's been. So Milo Yiannopoulos, who is he? Who is he? He's a British dude who pretends he's American. Is that right? Which is very strange. But he's a, he's a guy that causes a lot of uh, furor worldwide and he came to Australia, was invited to speak in our parliament and did a couple of little talks, a bit of a speaking tour, very short one, uh, and some people didn't want him here. Not only did they not want him here, Chris, but they wanted him banned. They wanted him banned. Sarah Hansen Young had her knickers in a knot. Well, our topic tonight is free speech, so... I, I guess we're bringing Milo into it because uh, you want to know if banning him is uh, against free speech. I want to know if you're part of the censorship brigade, Chris. I try not to be because I value free speech. So what did you think when you heard Sarah Hansen Young say that he should be banned? What was your initial response? I was like, yeah. Turn him around at the airport and give him a kick up the backside. Actually, if we've sort of established that it's okay to punch Nazis in the face, then, <laughs> you know. But, um... Yeah, so that, that was my initial reaction, sure. Yeah. What, you got a problem with that? I've got a problem with that. <laughs> okay. I don't think banning people is the right way to go. I mean, if he was someone who advocated for people to go around starting fights and if he was advocating for there to be an Australian Nazi party, then, yeah, I would be far more inclined to support banning him. But he's not saying anything that's violent. He's just saying words and using 
hyperbole to connect emotionally with his audience. Also, I think making some insightful, nuanced points along the way. Yeah, so my initial reaction was to like punch him or turn him away, but I do value value free speech and pacifism. But to say that his ideas aren't dangerously provocative... Well, that's what he calls himself. He calls himself a provocateur. That's his adjective. It's a good word. It's a great word. Yeah. I'd never heard of it before him. <laughs> I wish people called me a provocateur. You, you can get there. You can work on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just a lot of the things that, that I've sort of come across that, from what I've gathered that he said that is riled people up. Including you. Including me. You know, like feminism is cancer. Well, when he says feminism is cancer... Mm. I both see myself as a feminist yeah, and I also really like his use of language there. I think it's really funny. Okay. Um, what about is, is talking about having sex with young boys funny to that being an okay thing? He's spoken about that before. That's probably what's got him in just about the most amount of trouble worldwide. Yeah, that got his, that got his publishing deal cancelled. Yeah. And got uh, him fired from Breitbart, however you pronounce it. Oh, Breitbart, yes. That was that the, alt, the alt-right uh, magazine that he worked for. And he's been a part of Gamergate, which was a group of people that didn't like female game developers. They thought that the female game developers were changing games to have less female characters with great big boobs or something. And they were really angry about it. And they harassed women out of the gaming industry. They just harassed and harassed and harassed. Uh, Other things he said, he said things like gays are more likely to abuse people sexually. He is gay for one thing. We haven't mentioned that yet either. He is gay himself. He's married. To a black guy. That's correct. He attacks fat people. He attacks poor people, you know, like stop being poor. Poor people, he says. Uh, he's attacked Native American Indians who are demonstrating at the pipeline and telling them to get over their feelings or something. You know, it was like, I don't care about your feelings. Just, you know, shut up about it. I don't care. Get over it. He's got Nazi fanboys. He joined the MRA sort of movement when that kicked off. He wears gold chains. What's wrong with gold chains? Gosh, that's well, just- the most superficial thing you've ever brought up. <laughs> For me, he's all a show. He's he's just this dick and he just it seems to all be about fame and I'm not sure what he actually believes. And a lot of people, you know, are frustrated because they don't know what he actually believes. So I think he's a troll. He calls himself a some sort of devout troll or something, but I think he's an insincere troll. I think he's just a troll. Even Sam Harris, one of your guys that you like, said what was the quote? He said, um, He said, my basic gripe with Milo is that he strikes me as fairly insincere. I mean, he appears to be trolling all of humanity at this point and having a lot of fun doing it. Half of what he says about social justice warriors and political correctness and Islamophobia is very incisive and amusing, but he seems to approach everything as a performance, and this leads me to wondering what he actually believes. So for me, he's a troll, and so if he's a troll and he seems to get some sort of rise out of it, why are we giving him a platform at all? So just like how in the Bible there are different books and different styles of writing and you need to interpret each one differently, you need to know what you're being exposed to when you're coming across Milo Yiannopoulos. He's not the rights version of Noam Chomsky. <laughs> right, yep. He is not a statesman or anything like that, no. No, he is not. He's there to provoke, have a bit of fun, preach to the choir, and he definitely goes into offensive, provocative places, and he does that by design. And I agree with Sam Harris that there does come a point where you start to wonder how much of it he actually believes and how much of it is just pure showmanship. Um, But along the way, I've heard him say many intelligent, complex things that our society does need to grapple with. And so freedom of speech is one of those. Like, so, like I don't think you have looked into these. I haven't that much because he's just a jerk. <laughs> he's like, Yeah, but that's, that's my point, that the people who think he's a jerk haven't actually looked at any of the context. He's always punching down, never up. His whole shtick is offending people and being provocative and 
you know, that can lead to inciting hateful views and giving permission to his fan club to be as much of a dick as he is. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I've heard him say the opposite, that he only ever punches up, he never punches down. You know, the reason he got banned from Twitter was because he was having a crack at the African-American lady from the Ghostbusters reboot saying she was, I don't know, talentless or ugly or whatever he was saying. He does the same sort of thing with other celebrities. On this tour of Australia, during his speech, he'll bring up a photo of Clementine Ford and say, what, she's unfuckable or something like that? Yeah, he's all class. Uh, Well, for me, his shtick is to be a performer, is to say offensive things, to get a reaction, but I still think his ideas can be dangerous. You know, he's an icon of the alt-right. He has influence over people. He can use that to belittle others and to give permission to his followers to uh, harass, like, women and turn out to be as much as a dick as him. Uh, He even calls Trump daddy. What does that matter? Trump is not good for the world. You're not to that point, are you? No, I'm definitely not a fan of Trump. Trump's a... He's a lunatic. (laughs) Right. And he's also dangerous when he defends rape culture as something that isn't real. Well, so what is rape culture? What do you think he's saying doesn't exist? The people who are trying to change uh, some of our cultural norms to deter, you know, men from treating women as objects and thinking that they're entitled to do what they want with women whenever they want. He thinks that the concept that there's any sort of problem between men and women isn't really there. So I think what he is arguing against when he talks about rape culture Mm. is that the left make it out like there's an actual epidemic going on at the moment. I think he's saying that there really isn't. Okay. Like, I think we, we've talked about on other podcasts that to be a woman in 21st century Western civilization is about as good as you've ever had it. Mm. Now, it doesn't mean it's perfect. Mm. We shouldn't be pretending that this is a bad society for women to be growing up in. This is a good society for women to be growing up in. We shouldn't be beating ourselves up. We should be going, holy heck, we've done a brilliant job at equality in our country. We shouldn't be pretending like there's a big issue with rape in Western society. Like, we have laws. If someone rapes someone in our society, then they should be charged. But we've been through this before that, you know, uh, and it's not just rape, it's, you know, sexual harassment as well. Like, that's blown up in, in the media recently. So many people are being found out for this. But when we've looked at the figures before, you know, when you're looking at one in three and one in five women, you know, experiencing quite serious harassment and there is a large amount of domestic violence that happens in Australia, uh, two women. Yeah, so domestic violence is an issue. Yeah. I don't think rape culture is. He's not saying that there's nothing wrong if someone rapes someone. He's just saying that we don't have a systemic issue where there's organisations that are going around saying it's okay. We are not living in Middle East. Yeah, look, we're in a better world for women than we've ever been. But he's still potentially party to something, which is a culture that trivialises, you know, all the prevailing attitudes that normalise sexual assault and abuse and we can see that that's still something that's prevalent within our culture because of we just talked about the Me Too campaign a few episodes back. This is an experience that is common for women, that they have to deal with sexual harassment. So is rape a massive issue within our nation? No. Compared to to other places, the numbers would say no. But is there still, well, is it dangerous to talk about normalising sexual assault and and abuse and saying that it's not an issue that we need to work on. It's not just about all of the things that he says, you know, but for me it's also sometimes about the way that he says it. And it's the fact that I don't feel like he has any compassion for anyone. Where's the compassion for anyone? It's all this show, this, this caricature. I mean, why attack women at every opportunity? Because he thinks that they are pretending there's an issue that really doesn't exist, that they're just creating fear where fear doesn't need to exist. Like, do you actually think that Australia is a dangerous culture for women to grow up in? No, not when you compare it to other places, no. Or other times in history. Yeah, no. Or if you compare it to anything. No, no, my wife, she walks home in Western Sydney often. I mean, she's been harassed on a small handful of occasions, but she's not going to let fear stop her from living. But I do want to see a culture that everyone adopts that stops 
you know, the dickheads from thinking they're entitled to say whatever they want to a woman whenever they want or to take whatever they want. That's what the culture leads to. And I don't feel Milo helps a public discourse, you know, to invite him to speak in parliament and then fly out tomorrow. I don't know why it was worth it. But you don't need to know why it was worth it because like, free speech is saying, like accepting that you will hear views that you disagree with. Mm. And the minute you start saying that we should ban these people is the minute that next time someone will say that your views are banned. Yeah, so you, yeah. you just can't have it. You can't. Oh, yeah. We don't want to go all the way down that road. But why go down the road of letting him talk in Parliament at all? Did you just say why are we letting him talk at all? Yeah, yeah, I did. Not to censor him or put him in jail. But if I trust that enough people have so much of an issue with him, I don't want to give him that much of my attention. And so why should we care what he says? Why are we giving him a platform to speak within our parliament, which is what David Lionhelm is doing? I mean, yeah, I don't really want to talk about him, but I do want to talk about free speech. And free speech is often, you know, it's a good way of describing a value that we have, but can sometimes be a poor way because it's not just about speech and it's not always free. There are regulations and when it comes to speech, that can cover a wide array of things as we've discovered as people have taken free speech stuff to court, you know, that can cover actions, intent and creativity and probably freedom of expression is a better way to describe it. And so what I think David Lionhelm is expressing is that by booking Milo for to speak in Parliament, he's giving validity to views that I don't think deserve that much validity because it's pretty much rubbish. So I agree with you that freedom of speech doesn't mean that Milo Yiannopoulos must be invited to come and speak at Parliament House. Uh, I don't think it was a good idea for David Lionhelm to invite him, but I'm far more worried when someone who should be a serious politician in Sarah Hansen Young then comes out saying that he should be banned. That, I think, is that's a massive line that shouldn't be crossed. We should never even be tempted to ban someone from a country just because we don't like their views. Yeah, uh, and... I have to agree with you. I just hold out these little bits like we've made a society where we try and, you know, not have uh, all sorts of discrimination. You have the freedom to offend someone else, but you shouldn't really have the freedom to go out there to want to hurt someone else with your words. And that's a tricky line to try and balance across at times because you'll unintentionally, yeah. you will unintentionally hurt I people. I agree with that. So, yeah. so it should never be your aim to go out and hurt people. No. But the fear of offending people should never prevent you from saying what you want to say. It should sort of keep you in check a little bit to be, you know, like putting a bit of a filter between your, your brain and your mouth and going, am what I am about to say, is that going to potentially hurt someone that should be the second thing you yeah. think of but the first thing you think of should be firstly is it true right secondly is it an important thing for me to be talking about right now mm. and then the third thing should be is it going to hurt anyone and if if the first two things are true like if it ticks those boxes then i don't even really care about the third one it's like the story of socrates this philosopher, or I guess you'd say he was a teacher, he had a student come up to him and say, oh, Socrates, buddy, you know, I've got to tell you something about this other guy. And he's like, whoa, 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 hang on. Is it true? Is what you're going to tell me true? I'm just telling you now that I have these certain tests that you've got to pass. And if you pass these tests, you may tell me this information. So one, is it true? And the other guy goes, oh, well, this other guy told me. about." It. So you don't know if it's true. Socrates is going, you don't know if it's true. You didn't see it yourself. You didn't hear it yourself. Someone else told you. He's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's going, okay, you can still pass my test. The second one is what you're going to say kind about this other person. He goes, oh, <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. You should hear this. Whoa, whoa, well, hang on. You don't know if it's true. You don't know if it's kind, but you can still pass my test. So the third one I want to know is, is this going to be helpful to me to know? And the other student goes, oh, oh. I guess not really. I just thought, sort of thought you'd want to know about it. He's going, no, okay. So you don't know if it's true. You don't know if it's kind. You don't know if it's helpful. I don't want to hear it. You know, so this is, this is a story about gossip. This is not about free speech. But I just sort of like that idea of filtering what you say to others. You listed 
basically those things. You, what was yours? The first one was true. I am Socrates is the thing we should get out of that. <laughs> so, yes, Socrates, Nick. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's good to have that filter of is it kind, is it true, is it helpful? And if you're just going to stand up for free speech by using the tools at your disposal of being unkind, untrue or unhelpful, don't you potentially put free speech in danger because people are going to want to shut you down. So we have a responsibility if we value free speech to not just be a troll but to do the right thing with it. But like when when Sarah Hansen Young or Bob Brown or Richard Di Natale or any of these guys come out and talk about um, immigration, yep. they are giving speech to people who will say that we should just let anyone in. And that could be the end of our civilization. Like if you just let anyone in, like that would be it. Australia would just become another third world country. Then what, are you, you going to say that Greens politicians aren't allowed to talk because there's people in their audience who have wacky ideas? You can't hold them to the views of the people that support them. You as a leader, you have a responsibility to lead people in a way that has the greater good in mind. And look, yeah, he can claim that too. He can claim some of the things that he says. He wants to warn the West not to go yeah. down this path of the left and social justice warriors. And so, you know, he's going to say that that's the greater good. But, you know, for one thing, they're elected officials for one. So they actually speak for someone. So my question is, who does he represent? He just had a sold out tour. <laughs> yeah, but who's he got? I mean, if you stand in the crowd and look around, it's suits, it's blokes with make America great again caps, it's men's rights activists, it's Nazis. Is that who you want to be rubbing shoulders with? And in the front row? Lane Home, Malcolm Roberts, and Pauline Hanson. It's essentially real life South Park. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is so much like someone who gets up in front of a South Park crowd. Oh my God. Um, reality can be weird. Look, I understand and cherish the role of dissent, subversiveness, satire, and sounding offensive, you know, but that being to incisively help us get to get to a new awareness. But for someone who so many people I respect takes so much issue with, then with Milo... Where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah, basically. Good. I'm glad you bring this up because there's some more smoke that I wanted to bring up. Have you heard of Charles Murray? No. So Charles Murray is an American sociologist he wrote a book called The Bell Curve, which um, looked at research into IQ and race, the link between IQ and race. Yep. In March this year at Middlebury College in the US, he was there to do a public lecture and the students at the college shouted him down and prevented him from speaking, which sounds like you would have been in that crowd, Chris, not wanting people to be able to speak their views. So uh, that's a joke, people. <laughs> well, I think it was. <laughs> So he was then moved by university staff to a private recording studio because he wasn't able to do it in the public lecture hall. Mm. So he was moved to this private recording studio to stream the debate. However, the students managed to track him down, bang on the wall, set off fire alarms. And in the end, when he left the studio, a bunch of students surrounded him uh, and also the academics that were trying to look after him after they'd invited him to their university and these academics ended up getting injured. Uh, Murray's car was banged and rocked. The students followed him when he went out to dinner that night. And all of this was just because he wrote a book that linked IQ to race. Like, I encourage everyone to go and listen to interviews with this dude, read the book. He is not a racist. And you listen to him speak and you just go, this guy's so well thought out and he's not saying that you know, black people are stupid or that there's anything wrong with them. He's just like, he's just done research and these were the findings and he just is saying, oh, yeah, look, I know this is uncomfortable for everyone, but this is how it is. This book that he wrote, The Bell Curve, came out in 1994. It's not even new. It's like 30 years old. And there's this other dude. Um, have you heard of Larry Summers? The name, yeah, rings a bell. So he's a well-known economist, if there is such a thing. He worked as an economist in both Bill Clinton and Barack Obama's presidencies. He was the president of Harvard University for a while as well, and he was forced to leave Harvard 
after suggesting that there may be a biological difference between men and women that might contribute to the low numbers of women in certain fields and occupations. And just by suggesting that that might be part of the reason, not the whole reason, but it might be part of the reason students just went mental and just got to the point where his job was untenable and he was forced to resign and all this sort of stuff. It, I don't know if you've seen this in schools, but I was talking to a teacher earlier this year about evolution and asking why this teacher doesn't talk about evolution in school because I love talking about evolution. I find it fascinating. And I was talking about evolution to some students in the class and they were saying they don't get taught about it and that was fairly shocking to me. And so I asked the teacher, you know, why don't you ever talk about this? And she said, well, it's just too dangerous to talk about these subjects because we'll get an angry parent Hmm. ringing us up and it'll make my job more difficult and they don't want their job to be more difficult. And so any subject that, that is even remotely dangerous or provocative we end up not discussing for fear of offending anyone. And it's ridiculous. It, it's harming our education system. It's harming our public discourse. It's creating these online communities where people are just in their own echo chamber and they don't engage with other people with different views because they're so afraid of being offended. It's, it's ludicrous. Well, I read a study... And this is partly why I think that someone like Milo Yiannopoulos is dangerous, but it's, you know, a study like that, which is controversial, I guess. It was about how to turn a conservative into a progressive and how to turn a progressive into a conservative. And it was to do with the brain structures of conservatives and progressives, that there was a difference within the, I forget what the part of the brain called, some amygdala or something. but Amygdala. Amygdala, I guess. It was the fear center. Of the brain. Yeah. Uh, and so they were saying that conservatives have long known, proven 50, 60, 70, and maybe more years ago, that you put a progressive in a situation and you you make them feel scared and, and their views will start shifting to be much more conservative. This was at Yale. They were doing this test on, on conservative people because, yeah, the fear centre is larger. And that, that's not in and of itself bad. It, it's about the fact that a conservative mind... They prioritise safety and security, and safety and security aren't bad things, you know, but that's, Hmm. so they prioritise that. So what they did was they spoke to these conservatives and they got them to imagine that they had a superpower and that they were invulnerable and that they, you know, they got them to go through all of these things where they imagined that they couldn't be hurt in any way. Then they addressed all of these different policy issues and were able to, shift them to look at things from a very progressive mindset because they felt safe and secure. Only on social issues, I might add. No one moved on economic issues. They all stayed where they were. On social issues, they were able to move. But it's the same. If you, if you scare a progressive enough, safety and security will become a, a priority. I feel like the conservative mindset and someone on the right or the alt-right, which is, you know, Milo is a, an activist and a provocateur from the alt-right, and this is the controversial sort of thing is that I wouldn't mind sitting down with Milo one-on-one and having a conversation with him because I feel like I have a strong enough sense of self and a strong enough sense of my own values that anything that he says isn't going to corrupt me. So he's free to say whatever he wants to me. But I feel like that there are a lot of people who, because of their propensity towards fear, uh, that someone like him is able to manipulate, you know, they're more vulnerable to being manipulated by things that he says, or they will see something in him that they want to see, and that will give them permission to do stuff that is just shit. Do we ban him? No, you can't do that. And suggesting to ban him is a dangerous idea. Yeah, it's a dangerous idea. We want to maintain free speech. It's something that's really important. We've already ceded a whole bunch of freedoms due to the climate of sort of terrorism you know we'd have less privacy on governments can check our phones our internet usage then there's always the media that we're hacking people we have less freedoms we've got to go through a whole rigmarole at the airport we're giving away little bits of freedoms here and there all the time and even there are like special investigations units that mean that they can you know put people away without having to give much of a reason why for a couple of weeks and stuff but i'm not worried about that i don't care because i I trust the Australian government is not going to use any of that for nefarious purposes. But for somewhere else, another country, or in the future, you know, would 
we don't want to see too many of our freedoms. For me, it's about finding that balance between free speech being an individual right, but not to the point where it's against the public good, but, you know, where that line is against the public good. I mean, you were drawing a, a pretty distinct line, you know, with violence. But what is it for you? Like, is it offence? It can't possibly be offence. No, no, of course it's not offence. Okay, so what is it then? Well, hate speech. So violence. Hate speech isn't necessarily violence. We've got 18C, which is the Racial Discrimination Act, which is, you know, part of our whole free speech thing. So you can't racially vilify someone. What about harassment? What about so what? Because free speech is more than just speech. It's, it's expression. It's, it counts for flag burning as a form of free speech, uh, sky riding as a form of free speech, you know, things that we act as a form of free speech. Protest is free speech. Congregating is free speech. Art is free speech. The copyright comes under that. There's, there's all these sorts of regulations that come around all of those things. So expression is regulated. You know, you can't just go, I'm, well, Nick, you could just go run naked down the street because you want to. Is that a free speech thing? There's a potential that you'll get in trouble with the law for doing that. There is definitely the potential. If you get caught, you will. Probably get in trouble from my wife is the bigger issue. But some people will claim that that's a freedom, you know, of expression. Yeah. And, but, it's a, but it's decided that it's against the public good because, you know, there are young eyes that we don't want to see that sort of thing. So just drawing it just at violence, I don't think, is where you can just draw it. Now, that violence is an obvious one. I would like to see, I don't know, like um, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant back in 1784 detailed that politicians should have to give us a reasoned argument spelling out their line of thinking, their whole line of thinking towards an idea or an opinion or a policy so that the citizens could understand and form an opinion ourselves. And this is why free speech is really important because the citizens have to be able to tell the government that we think your policy is shit. Democracy depends upon free speech. If we can't dissent, hmm. <laughs> then we don't have democracy. Nowadays, we just get, because of the 24-hour news cycle, we just get the end point and no sort of substance. And we get all of this fake news. We get Trump just telling us flat-out lies. I don't think you can really make it happen, but I'd love to see some sort of thing where people can't just say bullshit in the public sphere like that. They should be held accountable in some way. There should be some fact-checking thing that holds them accountable. You can't just lie to people. Yeah. I mean, I can lie to you, but if I'm, if I'm someone with a position of power... Do you mean like there should be a, some sort of legal thing in place? Like, cause yeah, yeah. I yeah. think the idea with the democracy is that the consequence is that in three years' time we kick you out because you're a lying scumbag. I mean, yeah, and that works. But it'd be better if they didn't get in the first place if they're a lying scumbag. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. What about bullying? What about online bullying and stuff? That's do a bad you, do, thing. Yeah, but do you count that as, does that come under your violence thing? Is that a form of violence? Should that not be allowed? Or should that be allowed under free speech? One of the problems with online bullying is that people can hide behind anonymity. And a lot of people just say horrible things to each other online because they think that it doesn't matter. Online is real as life is real. Um, I, I don't know. I've never created a false identity online because I want to stand by what I say. So the idea that there would be a law that convicts people of things that they say mm. is a dangerous idea to me. The yeah, idea that you would have a law that says this person said something offensive on Twitter, I don't understand how that would be anything other than a dangerous idea for a democracy. There's two different questions there. There's one is, is it moral? Mm. And the other one is, is it legal? So, no, it's not moral, but yes, it should be legal. And I probably agree with you. <laughs> so, and, and so I'm not trying to tell you that Milo is a good person. I wouldn't have any idea. I felt like you were trying to say that. Because right. I'm like going, he's completely immoral. And yes, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my own bias to make that assumption. I think the way I would say it is I hear you trying to paint him as the devil and I don't think he's the devil. I think he's very thoughtful. I think he's very articulate. I think he's worth... Who said the devil wasn't thoughtful? <laughs> I'm not saying he's an idiot. Obviously, he's very smart because he's making a living out of this. Yeah. The devil would be using his wit for nefarious purposes, whereas I don't think he is. I think he genuinely believes that all the stuff he's saying. Mm. 
So one of um, one of your heroes, Chris, Brian Cox. You're a bit of a Brian Cox fan, aren't you? Yeah. Because you're a big fan of science. Yeah. So he's a he's a physicist who was in a band in the eighties. Yeah. Anyway, he's he's a legend. I like him. Chris yeah. likes him. Yeah. He said that I disagree very profoundly with the idea that there's such a thing as a safe space intellectually at a university. University is supposed to be a place where civilised debate takes place. If not the university, then where do you debate the most difficult questions? Mm -hmm. I agree with all of that other than the university part of it. Like I think that should be everywhere. It should be anywhere in a democratic society. We are free to talk about any of these issues. The idea that you would censor debate, I think, is a dangerous idea. We should be able to have contentious conversations in the coffee room at morning tea time. Sure. How contentious? So long as it's not harming people. You you shouldn't be allowed to say, Jews are evil, we should kill them all. You shouldn't be allowed to say that. Yeah. Because that is inciting violence. But you should be allowed to say, Mm. this movie is shit, and just because it's shit, you can't come out and start crying and then get banned from Twitter. That's stupid. And you should be able to do research that says that there is a difference in IQ between certain races without being shouted down and violently forced out of a university. And all of us, especially the left, should be standing up for free speech in those issues, in those circumstances. But they don't. The left do not. They do the opposite. They make it out that the the person is a baddie, that Milo's a baddie, that Charles Murray is a baddie. But I think those people would say... That these ideas that they're presenting are what are harmful to social cohesion, and you could say that their shouting down of that idea is harmful to social cohesion. What's harmful to social cohesion is when instead of looking at the facts, we just listen to the headline and we just write them off as racists or sexists or whatever. Like this Charles Murray dude can't have a conversation about IQ and race. It just gets shouted down like, oh, you're a racist. Yeah. Whether it's true or not, it's an extremely dangerous idea to put in the public sphere as far as social cohesion is concerned. It could result in completely unintended consequences from him. You so know, we shouldn't be able to bring up that gay people have higher rates of suicide. No, that's fine. It's exactly the same thing. No, no, it's not exactly the same thing because if you're talking about higher rates of IQ among different races, then what was the Aryan race? You know, what was Hitler on about? Killing Jews? Yeah, but it was about the superior race. He was the superior race. Now, if you're going to give some sort of evidence to someone that they're of a superior race to someone else, that's a dangerous idea. It can be used and abused in a way to abuse other people and to... Yeah, so can the homosexuality and suicide thing because people make the the link by saying that, well, it's obviously a deviant behaviour because people are killing themselves in high rates. So they, even themselves, they know that it's the wrong behaviour to be doing. So yes, you can make that argument, but it doesn't mean it's right and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be able to make it because there's other conclusions you can draw from it that, hey, maybe we're not treating these people right. And you can make the same conclusions from IQ and race. You can say, well, geez, maybe these people have been screwed over for so long and we're not educating them properly. And like you can make a whole bunch of things and you can use that data to plan how you address the problem. Whereas if you just ignore the data and pretend it doesn't exist because it is going to put a risk to social cohesion, then you actually aren't addressing the issue. That's the only thing that won't address the issue is if you just ignore it because it's too dangerous. Right, but if it's dangerous, it's, you know, there is danger. (laughs) In an ideal world, there should be just free speech. But there are things that people say that hurt others. There are things that people say that can harm others. There are things that people say that can be dangerous, that can lead to unintended consequences. And I I think I see you often getting really frustrated that like when we did the Freedom of Religion uh, podcast, you were like, everyone should be free to say no to whoever. I think what I'm trying to say is that it's easy for you to say that sort of stuff because you have the sense of self you're strong enough to deal with someone having a a different view to you, having a go at you. 
like the whole idea of sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. That may have worked for you and it, it works, works for me. I don't think there's much anyone can say that can harm me except to those that are really close to me and they wouldn't say You wouldn't have them close to you otherwise. Yeah, so I don't think there's really anything that anyone can say that can harm me, but I I just sort of feel like not everyone's that strong and not everyone's that secure. I guess I just see a lot of young people who are not very resilient in where I work. So the, the things that people say do hurt. Does that mean those things should be banned? No, it doesn't. It can't. Um... But it does mean that we need to be teaching each other Mm. how to cope with other people holding different views to ourselves and how to cope with people attacking our views, that we need to be able to differentiate between the things that I believe and me as a human being. So if someone attacks my views, Mm. I can't, me as a human being, I can't immediately think they're attacking me as a human being. We need to be teaching young people to be able to have debates with people that you disagree with into instead of shut down debate to instead say no let's open up debate and let's help young people to say having this conversation is a good thing and that they have a view that you find abhorrent that's fine and they're allowed to Mm. think that you're you've got awful views yeah we need to teach that to young people because at the moment i don't see and it's not just young people but you know through a lot of our society i don't see the readiness (laughs) <laughs> to accept that and, and I mm. think that that's why when there are dangerous ideas and I like dangerous ideas you know I, I want to hear dangerous ideas you know they have dangerous ideas festivals and stuff and I'm like that's cool you know yeah but for many in our society a dangerous idea is dangerous to our society <laughs> so yeah while we value free speech we also value that social cohesion so how far are we willing to pay the cost at certain times for less freedom so that we can have more social cohesion yeah i worry about someone presenting a paper on iq levels and race i wonder if we're ready to hear something like that and deal with it appropriately and we're definitely not ready to deal with it i can tell you that well yeah so there was the evidence so last 30 years of that man's life But the solution to it all isn't in shutting down debate. It's in opening up debate. It's in saying, let's let's hear everyone's points of view. And we want to hear your point of view. Please. (laughs) We do. We've actually had a few people recently, Chris, uh, come forward with some of their ideas and we're pretty keen on getting some of our dear listeners on the podcast to chat with them about different topics. We certainly are. So if you're one of those people... Yeah, you can come on, you can be offensive, that's fine. So long as you're okay with me having a go at you and Chris doing whatever Chris does. I'll be nice. Yeah, Chris will be nice. Good Chris cop. is the good... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good cop, bad cop, yeah, yeah. Hey, I still wanted to talk about uh, free speech in relation to anonymity. Like, mm. <clears throat> should you be able to be anonymous? Doesn't that lead to... <laughs> more of this repugnant stuff and, and, and less social cohesion and, and it being unhelpful. But then there's the other part of it is like anonymity can be really important. If You know, like when the Arab Spring uprising thing happened, if they didn't have anonymity, mm. they wouldn't have been able to survive, you know. So should people be allowed to be anonymous on the internet? Yes. You think because, they should, yeah? Yeah, because the alternative is... Like, that's scary and dangerous. Like, I agree with you that that is one of the problems with the online, the comments section of any place online, is Mm. that people uh, will say things online that they would never say to a person's face. Yeah, the ability to remove, like, that the screen is between you and the other person, and that is a unhelpful thing for civil discussion. So if it's that unhelpful and it breathes so much harassment and hate speech and stuff like that but you still like well we're gonna have to deal with that yeah because without it well firstly i don't know how you stop it anyway even if you wanted to stop it like there are legitimate areas where people want to be able to be kept anonymous so media sources we want journalists to be able to keep media sources anonymous and like you were talking about with you know there's other societies in the world where they're reporting on circumstances and if it was found out who they were, they could be killed. So we want that. 
All right. So even though, you know, some people end up committing suicide because of online bullying and stuff like that, because that happens. I don't know. I sort of agree with you, but... I'm sure it contributes to it, but you can't say that a person committed suicide directly because of online abuse. It would have been part of the snowball that Mm. gathered momentum that led to them committing suicide. It's not the only part of the story. Can a person who contributed to it be held culpable in any way, shape or form? I don't know. I'm not a law expert. Because there was that case in America of this is not an online thing, but there was that young girl who had a boyfriend. They were both sort of involved in a little culture of being overly depressed and self-harming and everything. And and anyway, he got to the point where, uh, well, she was convincing him to commit suicide and he hopped in a car you know, putting the exhaust into the car to kill himself. And he came out of the car and he was texting her saying, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. And she said, get back in the car and finish the job. And he got back in the car and he finished the job. Yeah, so that's a very direct link. Yes, it's a very direct link. So so she went down for that. but And her major reason for doing that was because she wanted the attention of all of the people because she would have, her boyfriend just died. It was a pretty sick case. So she didn't pull the trigger, but yeah, there's... Yeah, that's manslaughter. Yeah, and she went down for that. <laughs> Good. So, okay, so, but where... But you don't need specific laws. We've already got a manslaughter law. Yeah, we do. Okay. So if someone is bullying someone online and tells them to go kill themselves, which happens all the time... Yeah, but that's that's different to the story you just outlined. I know. I know it's different, but to what degree? Is yeah, well, well, we'll let the judges work that out. Fair enough. Okay. Like, on each individual case... Yeah, like I agree that there are cases like the one you just outlined that, yeah, what that woman did is awful. That's very different to, you know, a person saying one comment online of go kill yourself because like like you said, that happens all the time. It does. Now, yeah. again, I want to make it very clear that I do not think that's appropriate behavior. <laughs> that is awful behavior, right. but that doesn't mean it should be illegal. Yeah, right. I mean, ultimately, it'd be great if we could regulate ourselves. <laughs> that yeah, way. that would be nice. <laughs> yeah. The court of public opinion does play a huge part in helping us to regulate ourselves. You know, when you, mm. if you make that much of a dick of yourself, you'll be ostracized. Or if you're beside someone and you see them make a dick of themselves and get ostracized, maybe then you go, ah, oh, okay, I can't just say whatever I want whenever I want now. Um, I've got to regulate myself. Because if we had like an LED display sitting on top of our heads, showing every thought that was going through our minds, yeah, we'd probably all go down for something. I think I'd start wearing a burqa, Chris. (laughs) But going back to like you were talking about the media before reporting and stuff. So we've had our own media and our own doctors and psychologists, social workers, guards, church, charity groups, all sorts of people that have operated within Manus Island being silenced, threatened with jail term if they speak about the things that they have seen. So my question is... Is that a dangerous thing that our government is doing? But it's also like in most organisations and institutions and most jobs that you're in, there there was going to be some sort of, like in my job, I'm not allowed to talk to the media about something that's happened within my school. And that's, yeah. that's right and fair. Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting one, Chris. Yeah. Um, hang on, what was the first thing you said? Because I thought, that, oh, the, the Manus Island stuff. To me, that part of it is really obvious that, yes, that's very, very bad, that governments shouldn't be actively trying to stymie debate and shut people down from being able to talk about the things they've seen. Like, that's obviously a bad thing in my mind. The other question you brought up around the private sector and your place of employment, I find that fascinating. Like, so you and I are both chaplains and I'm sure you remember there was a guy in Tasmania who was a chaplain Mm. who ended up losing his job as chaplain because he on his social media account he posted stuff that was essentially saying that homosexuality is a sin and i think you and i both agree that homosexuality isn't a sin Mm -hmm. but at the same time i think it's awful that he was fired for that because it's not like he's saying anything that's controversial in christian circles (laughs) like that's a very standard thing for a christian to say and it's weird to me that in a christian role (laughs) On his personal Facebook account, it wasn't like he was going into schools and saying this stuff. 
He was just saying it on his own personal account that he lost his job for that. While I disagree with what he was saying enormously, I also disagree with the idea that someone should lose their job for saying something away from their place of employment. On his own time, on his own private social media account, I, I don't know how you can fire someone for that. I'm glad I'm quitting, by the way, because that would be a very controversial thing for me to say <laughs> if I wasn't quitting. You say it's private, but it was it's sort of public to an extent. Nah, I, I think you can only fire someone for something they've actually done on the job that's inappropriate. You can't fire them because they have private beliefs that never show themselves in your place of employment. If someone turns up to work and does their job every day and then they get home and they're lazy asses, well, you can't fire them because they're lazy at home. If they're doing their job, they're doing their job. Mm. If someone's a sexist pig at home but then they come to work and they treat everyone fine and they're, they're not sexist, well, that's fine. People do lose jobs over, you know, scandalous behaviour that's not from at work and there might have been more to the other story. I don't know. I don't know what we do going forward. Unless you want to start paying people 24 hours a day. If you want to do that, then fine. (laughs) Well, so one of the things that I've been concerned about what's happening in our society is in a very short period of time, we've made a lot of social change. So from the 60s through to now, there's been the gay rights movement, which has obviously had a massive change in the last year in Australia to, to race stuff, you know, Aboriginal Australians didn't have the right to vote not that long ago. Same thing with women. Women didn't have the right to vote in the not-too-distant history. And so we've had all of these changes and all of these social issues that needed to be fought and they have been fought and, by and large, they've been won. And so there's been all these people that have been part of the civil rights movement and part of activism. Because of all that, we've had awesome social progress But we've sort of got to a point where society is full of these people who have been fighting for decades for progress. We're in a pretty good place in terms of all three of those issues, gender equality, racial equality, and sexual equality, Mm -hmm. that all these people are now sort of struggling to find new things to fight against, (laughs) that there just isn't any real fights to be fought. So they end up making up fights that don't really exist. So, you know... uh, Someone that's an anti-racist campaigner needs there to be racists. If there aren't any racists, they've got nothing to fight against. And so they end up creating people to be these characterizations that don't really exist. This Milo dude ain't that bad. Charles Murray is not this racist dude that you think he is. Not you personally, Chris, but... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you're saying. I guess I would say in reply to that that... Uh, who am I to tell someone that racism isn't an issue or that gender equality isn't an issue or that sexual equality isn't an issue if I can't experience anything from their point of view? You know, I'm not female, I'm not gay, I'm not black. So if someone is telling me uh, that this is an issue that they're experiencing and it's a valid concern that they have and it's something that they want to fight for, uh, I want to listen. Listen doesn't mean agree. You can listen and disagree. Yeah, but I don't want to say that, oh, it's all a myth. There's no rape culture. I don't want to do that. I want to engage with them and listen and hear from them how they describe their experience and their concerns and attempt to address their concerns and to support them within that. So first place I want to start with is listening. Yeah, I agree. Listening is the place to start, but I don't think listening has to move into agreement. No, it doesn't have to. I think when I look at the problems there are in our world, those sort of identity issues just aren't big issues in 21st century Australia. If you want to be a feminist, talk about Saudi Arabia. Don't talk about whatever pay gap there is in Australia. Why not? Because it's not a real problem. It it is a problem if they say not a problem. It doesn't mean that it's as big a problem, but you can address more than one problem at a time. We're humans. We can multitask. Yeah, we can. Yeah. So you can acknowledge the problems that we still have within our own society, even though our society, where else would you rather be than our society in this day and age? We've made this social progress that we should be proud of. 
part of the problem is that there's, yeah, there's often not a feeling that we're proud of how far we've actually come, but there's, there's still things that can be done. Yeah, of course there are. Yeah. But if, if you're the, the age newspaper, mm. you can only have one thing on your front page. Mm. You can say we can have, you know, lots of different issues in there and you can, but you have to prioritize. And so for me as an individual, yeah, I can do lots of different issues, but I still have to prioritize. I have to work out which are the ones that really need fighting about. And if you want to talk about gender stuff, then issues in Australia just do not count. Like they are not worth fighting about because there are far bigger issues in our world where women are having their clitorises cut off, like not just one or two people. That's not an aberrant behaviour in those societies. That is the norm. That is what happens to every young girl in that society. That is a feminist issue. Mm. It's a feminist issue that women are forced to live in cloth bags. That is a feminist issue. It's a feminist issue that women are sex slaves of their husbands in these cultures. That is a feminist issue. It's You can't focus on everything. You can't say that these things are analogous. They're not. Those things are important. The issues in Australia for women just pale in comparison to those things. And if you could bring one issue up mm-hmm. out of those two, I hope you would bring up <laughs> the more severe one. Yeah, right. The comparison is vast, sure. But the paper, you know, is often going to focus on a local issue because it's something that we might have more control over. And maybe when, a, when we fix our own backyard, we're better placed to model or speak into another place. But look, I don't want us to become too insular anyway. But when you're a young girl and you get sexually harassed by some creep sending you dick pics, your experience of pain and hurt, that's real. The girl half a world away who's trafficked for sex, her experience is horrific. It's worse. But for the girl here... She still has to face her pain. She has to address that. It matters. You can't say we shouldn't be addressing that. No, of course not. Yeah. But, but, but the way, mm. but I know for me personally, one of the things that helps me keep perspective in my life is by remembering how shitty other people have things in our world. Mm. And because what happens then is anytime something bad happens to me, I just go, well, geez, it's not that big a deal, is it? Mm. And so keeping those things in the forefront of your mind of how bad other people have it in the world helps me mm. to cope with whenever, you know, if someone sends me a dick pic, I'm not going to care less mm. because there's bigger things going on in our world and I'm aware of them and I yep. want to be aware of them. Yeah, and it's a good perspective Now, you know, a 14-year-old isn't going to be aware of that and that's fine. I'm not having a crack at her. Mm. How would they have any idea? For me, I'm an adult. I should be aware of what's going on in the world and I shouldn't get caught up in the wage gap or whatever it is. Like they're just, I as a adult who should know better, I should be able to work out which ones are more important and which ones are less important. Yeah. I, and I think that having that perspective can be really helpful. <laughs> I know when I get really whingy about my own life, then I take a step back that it actually puts me in a lot better headspace mm. when I realize how lucky I am. But I still need to, I still had to go through a process of, treating my own depression, you know, that was still Mm. something that mattered, you know. So, yeah, it doesn't equate to other people's experience, but my experience matters to me. But, man, it helps for me to have that perspective of the things that other people go through. Yeah, so I'm not saying that when you were struggling with your depression, your social worker should have come to you and said, how dare you be (laughs) just thinking about yourself? There's all these other things. I'm not saying that at all. Yeah, I know, yeah. But what I'm saying is as a society... We need to be honest about the current state of things in our world and not pretend like small issues are big issues and forget about the big issues that really are big issues. Yeah, and we can get too focused on our day-to-day and on us, and it can be a bit selfish, and I think that's understandable. It's us and our day-to-day after all. But we can, yeah, and we should have a more global outlook and perspective. But anyway, Nick, if there's one thing that you could say about free speech before we sign off, what would it be? Don't be afraid to offend people. There's nothing wrong with offending people. Fuck you, drummers are stupid. That's fine. Doesn't bother me because I'm able to separate my identity from what people say about me. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be 
more trusting that the people that we call friends are going to be able to put up with whatever views we have. And so if you're my buddy, Chris, I need to be able to trust that I'm going to be able to say these sort of things to you and it not end our relationship. And I just don't think most of us do that. Like, I don't think I've done that for most of my life. I think I've couched my views and been far too just regurgitating the views of other people that have shared their views with me. I think I just hear other people's views and then I go, yep, that sounds right. I'll go along with that. Instead of actually coming up with my own views, wrestling with them and articulating them, which forces you to wrestle with them even more Mm. and having pushback, having people say, no, you're wrong on this, this and this. Like I think we need to be able to trust each other to be able to have that conversation, to force uh, ourselves to work out what we believe and for god's sake don't worry if someone offends you it doesn't matter yeah uh that frustrates me that someone says something that offends them and they they either fall apart or they fight and i don't get it (laughs) um there's just a lot of things that we do unconsciously Uh, our unconscious mind and our conscious mind sort of exist together and our, our unconscious mind drives a lot of what we do and that's sometimes that's helpful sometimes it's unhelpful because it's a reflection of who we are but it it saves us from having to do too much thinking if you had to think about stuff all the time it'd drive you nuts but just to let it run all the time and not consciously challenge yourself i know honestly nick it's been challenging talking to you it's been challenging watching you take on your own personal challenge of moving from a view that i was very comfortable with you having to you immersing yourself in right wing type media and so on to to challenge your own perceptions and now to hear you um i wouldn't say regurgitating a lot of that i would say because i do trust that you are formulating your own opinions and it's challenging and i get frustrated with you (laughs) and then i look at myself and go why am i but what does that say about me because I, I remember hearing, you know, often the things that we admire in other people says a lot about what's in us and, and is latent within us but is yet to find full expression. And what annoys us most about other people is often, this is not a be-all and end-all, but it's often what annoys us about someone else is something that actually annoys us about ourselves but we, we haven't really owned up to that yet. Yeah. Whenever I'm really frustrated with somebody else and annoyed with them, If I take the time to reflect and I go, okay, so am I annoyed with them or am I annoyed with me? So the journey of doing this podcast (laughs) has been testing. Yeah, it's been testing. (laughs) But I, okay, this is the thing. Okay. I can see already how all of these discussions that we're having and how testing it is, how it's refining my own beliefs and challenging my own beliefs but helping me to understand what I believe and why to throw me into doubt at times and go, I don't get that, you know? And so I've found this process really rewarding and as challenging as it is and as challenging as I know it's going to be, I'm finding this really worthwhile. So thanks for pissing me off, Nick. (laughs) My pleasure. I think likewise, I feel like doing this podcast is, it's forcing me to, look at a broader range of viewpoints and yeah wrestle with what is mine and what isn't mine and i'm gonna find it hard to walk the same path that you're walking you don't have to to to, well to go that you know like i don't want to be someone that loses that idealistic i don't want to be someone that loses my heart sort of thing i don't Mm. and that's important to me it's something that i've carried from ever since i formed my what my father called my social justice streak yeah. Where that formed is so much of who I am, which is that people, when they get older, they start giving away all of this stuff because their heart dies. And, and I don't, I've never wanted that to be me. Yeah. No, nor should you. No, and uh, that's not saying that someone who, <laughs> you know, is conservative, their heart is dead. But it's just, I, I do have a bias towards that. In terms of the you not wanting to lose your heart yeah. thing, mm. I think... That's a virtuous way to be. Mm. But I think there is danger in it as well Mm. in that, like I'm sure you would have heard of, you know, if you go to Calcutta and walk the streets, there will be 
kids on the street holding their hands out, asking for money sort of thing. Mm. And aid organisations say that you shouldn't give money to that because often there's an adult behind it who they'll go and steal kids from their house and force them to sit on street corners. And so by giving money to these kids who, you know, your heart is just saying, I want to help these people, this poor little kid. Yep. So your heart can be pulled in directions that is actually harmful. Yeah. Wherever my heart guides me, Mm. I want to then use my head to examine where it's guided me and to say, is this really what it seems or is there a better course of action? Yeah, I like that. Reminds me of when I learned about the Greeks and they were very much about their head and about logic. And they gave us lots of logic. They gave us heaps of stuff like democracy. But I also learned about the ancient Jewish culture and tradition of wisdom, which was the heart and the head working together in harmony to arrive at a decision, uh, a belief, a course of action. And so, yeah, you want the head and heart, I want the head and the heart. So when it comes to free speech, let's be wise in how we use it. I think that's a good place to leave it, Nick. We've gone on long enough. So uh, thank you for listening. Catch you next time on the Eternity Ward. Much love. God here again. Are you shaking your head incredulously or nodding in approval? Well, if you got something out of this episode, you could really help those poor idiots by contributing to or supporting the Eternity Ward. You can leave reviews on iTunes or wherever you listen to it. You can share it on social media or discuss it in your blog, podcast or fellowship group. Subscribe, like, nod your head, raise your fist, send a hallelujah. I don't know, but don't send a 